Welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We have a great presentation planned for you today featuring Will Kahn, Vendor Management Facilitator at VCU Health. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, RepScrubs. RepScrubs offers vendor management and cost reduction solutions. The Rep Scrubs program provides assurance that every vendor entering a sterile department is wearing clean, prepackaged, disposable poly polypropylene scrubs dispensed on site while shifting the expense of providing those scrubs back to the vendor. The Rep Scrubs system offers hospitals a unique way of improving infection prevention and adherence to regulatory guidelines, reducing costs and enabling hospitals to better control and manage vendor access. For more information, visit repscrubs.com. For over 20 years, OR Today has provided perioperative and SPD professionals with up-to-date news and information about their profession. Our monthly magazine aims to educate readers about new guidelines, techniques, and equipment, as well as practical information for career building, problem solving, and overall well-being. If you would like a free subscription to our magazine, please visit ortoday.com forward slash subscribe. Today's webinar is elig eligible for one CE credit by the California Board of Registered Nurses. You can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your CE credit, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. As I mentioned earlier, Will Kahn is our presenter today. For 19 years, Will Kahn has held various roles within the OR as a surgical technologist, orthopedic team member, OR Scheduling Supervisor, Business Operations Manager, before moving into Supply Chain Administration two years ago and starting the Vendor Management Program. Will, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and thank you to everyone for the privilege of taking some of your time this afternoon. I wanted to give you a little bit about our journey uh, with Vendor Management and where we started, what, uh, we did to accomplish our goals and where we are today and what we're looking forward to. A little bit of background about VCU Health System. We are a three hospital system anchored by a level one trauma center. It's about a 785 bed facility uh, located downtown Richmond, Virginia. We started out as a lawless frontier with respect to vendors. We did have some scattered policies that apply to various vendor segments, whether they be medical device reps, pharmaceutical reps, uh, technical reps, or any other service salespeople. We had various modes of compliance and expectations from all these, but they were very scattered and did not have anyone able to oversee any compliance or to see uh, that the vendors were where they should be. They had unlimited access and were able to come and go as they please. <clears throat> Our healthcare staff were targets in their own facilities. The vendors were able to wander wherever they wanted and they popped in unexpectedly, very frequently, to offices, clinics, and the procedural areas. Uh, and that was to meet with any level of staff that they choose. It was at the vendor's discretion. Very rarely was it at the staff's discretion. We felt uh, somewhat like we were under siege uh, about three years ago, and it was kind of the status quo. We didn't really have a method of dealing with it, and no one really knew of a solution. The vendor representatives have one ultimate goal, and that is to get your business. Vendors by nature are very charming. Uh, they work to develop relationships with all levels of staff, be it from uh, team members, physicians, front office staff, uh, business operations staff. And their ultimate goal, again, is to get your business. 
most of the vendors' compensation packages are strongly tied to sales quotas. There's a very few companies out there that have a uh, base salary that is not tied to a quota. Those vendors obviously are not quite as motivated to increase either their sales of new or existing products and don't seem to be quite as aggressive as the ones that are uh, tied to the commission basis. Their commission and their livelihood depend on their abilities to get the facility to purchase their products. They depend on a older model of sales where FaceTime is absolutely critical to they have their conversations about their new products or services and feel like that is the best way that they can provide and support their previous purchases. Uh, they had not been doing any remote support on any widespread basis. Uh, they were tended to very strongly feel that they had to get in front of their end users and their decision makers within the facilities. Not all vendors are bad people. <laughs> I don't want anyone to get that impression that there is a uh, problem. There is a huge benefit to having vendors within your facility if it's well managed. Uh, there is a value added with this relationship. They are absolutely critical for innovation and enhancement of healthcare uh, within both the facilities, the clinics, and in the educational setting. This is where the research and development for many of the products come, uh, and they do need to be able to partner with many of the institutions to identify their needs and develop solutions that only industry can support. They also provide a strong amount of educational support for the facilities and for the team members. Uh, this is critical because it is nearly impossible for us to be able to send all of our uh, team members out for the appropriate level of training for competency on all of the products. Healthcare has become increasingly uh, diverse and very technical for all aspects. Uh, without this critical support, our staff would not be able to have any level of competency in order to utilize these products. The critical portion of having this well-managed partnership is to set boundaries, and these boundaries have to be very clear both to the vendors and for the team members for this to be accept, uh, in order for this to be appropriate and to be successful. It does provide a level of understanding and a level of expectations that do need to be managed by someone or some entity within your facility. Many physicians today have an extremely busy schedule. They are burdened with multiple electronic documentation needs, patient care needs, and just functioning within the systems. <clears throat> they have competing priorities and they generally do not have enough time to allow for un <clears throat> unexpected interruptions, such as drop-ins or the hallway conversation, the hard sell that tends to take place either in elevators or outside procedural rooms or just in passing. There are many challenges that we experience with vendor management. Traditionally, there is not a very focused approach. Uh, there are different aspects managed by multiple individuals or departments. Typically, it will fall either to a supply chain entity uh, along with materials management. There may be a linen component if there are scrubs involved. Uh, there may be a purchasing component if there is contractual issues that need to be identified, accounts payable uh, component that needs to justify the payment of certain products, and typically a strategic sourcing uh, entity that needs to also be identified with the identification of new products to come in there. And ultimately, it's also the end users, the clinicians that need to have somewhat of a say of who they want to speak to and when they want to speak to them. We had had management in isolation. We had each of those individual silos that dealt with vendors, again, in a very different and desperate uh, roles. There were certain policies that took place with the purchasing aspect, certain policies that took place with the vendors showing up at the facilities, uh, certain aspects of identification of gifts and entertainment that took place from vendors uh, both on-site and off-site. 
<clears throat> and we really didn't have a way of overseeing all this and making sure that there was a cohesive focused approach. We did have a vendor management platform that we had in place for probably about seven years prior to uh, where our story started two years ago. Uh, it was one of the earliest systems that was put out there. It was a first stab at vendor management when there were third party uh, credentialing systems that were put out there. Um, it served its purpose at the time, but again, it was only a tool uh, what I would say akin to the Stone Age, where you could do some very rudimentary functions with it, but it really was a challenge to be able to use it to build a strong vendor management platform. It caused an extreme lack of data, so we really did not know what our vendors were doing within our facilities. Uh, again, they came and go as they wish. They did not necessarily sign in or have an appointment. Uh, with our staff, and you really didn't know who vendors were in your environment. Many vendors did show up in the environment also wearing scrubs. This provided a fair amount of confusion, both with staff, other patients, with the assumption that if you see someone in scrubs within a healthcare facility, they would be assumed to be associated with the clinical staff. Uh, many of the vendors use this to their advantage to be able to blend in and to be able to get the access to the areas that they wanted. And again, it was exceedingly difficult both for new staff and for existing staff to really know who should be where and when. There was uh, extreme variation in the levels of staff engagement with being able to monitor these vendors within an R environment. We had some that felt very strongly that vendors should be watched, monitored, and controlled. We had others that just didn't really want to deal with it. They knew that if they raised a concern, there wasn't a really good way to address any issues. And unless vendors did something extremely egregious, they generally were able to get by and do whatever they wish. There was a overdependence of staff on vendor support, and I spoke previously about the level of education that was uh, required to be able to have competency with our products that we would use in the environment. Over the past few years, there has definitely been a shift from independence that we have had from our clinical staff to uh, extreme dependence to on vendors to be able to provide direction, identification, and usage of the techniques for their products. There was not a strong amount of vendor participation with education for our staff as it tended to promote the need to have vendors within the environment and it gave them that face time that they also would like to have had uh, with the physicians. If they have to be there to use even the simplest devices, that they're on nearly an everyday basis. And we needed to look for a better way to, to do that with our staff. This all created an entitlement culture with many within our vendor population. Uh, when we first developed a vendor management platform, there was significant pushback from a few companies uh, within our facilities that we actually had the quote, you can't do that to us, we have to be here to sell your products or to sell their products within our facility. Uh, and we did have to remind quite a few of them that we are not a public facility, it is a private facility, and we have the ability to dictate who we choose to do business with on an ongoing basis. Uh, many of these discussions took place at the very senior levels with some of our uh, vendor partners. And once they understood that we were looking for a partnership, not looking to actually get rid of anyone, uh, the, the conversation shifted and we were able to have some very tentative buy-in from some of our vendor partners. This all led to a predictable outcome. It was an absolute train wreck. Um, again, when I said we were the wild, wild west, that is exactly where we were. There was a lot of running around and not much uh, success with being able to organize and utilize our vendors to our benefit and as well for their benefit. About three and a half years ago, we had engaged a large consulting firm to help us with a transformative redesign of our supply chain. And one of the things that they had done was 
looked at all of our policies that we had regarding vendors, how we had products coming into the environment, who was supporting the products, what this was actually costing us on an ongoing basis to be able to have these people in the environment completely unfettered. Uh, we looked at that data and presented it to our senior leadership. And while everyone knew that we had had an issue, it had never been quantified or actually displayed to them for them to understand how much of an, an issue this was and what we could actually uh, solve by doing this. And I've got to give kudos to our senior leadership that we did recognize we had a problem and we did not allow pride to get in the way of our change. We were not so big to feel that we were all uh, encompassing with our knowledge base with this. We knew there had to be a better way. We just weren't quite sure how we were gonna get there or what the right steps were to take. Um, our consulting firm was extremely supportive with us as they had been nationally uh, to other organizations and had seen many of these similar issues. And again, they helped us identify that operating in silos without any kind of focused approach was harming us more than it was helping us. So we had a fresh start. We started uh, somewhere around the middle of 2018, developing new policies along the way and setting up the framework and a plan to go forward. We knew that there was a need for an actor vendor management strategy. Uh, and this was again, strongly supported by our uh, consultants that we had, but with a lot of engagement from our staff, from our senior leadership, uh, from our physician partners, uh, to what did everyone want out of this and what was it gonna look like and what the needs were. Senior leadership supported the creation of a very specific role to manage the vendor activities. And thus the position that I currently hold, the vendor management facilitator was created. Um, it was a very open type of role. Uh, it had some specific requirements for the type of individual that needed to be in that role and for what the obligations and the responsibilities were gonna be. But the job description was left open enough for a lot of on the fly uh, interpretation and the flexibility to be able to adjust and develop the role into what it needed to be. Uh, and we were gonna, we knew there would be some trial and error as we did it. We did not know everything again, but we had some support and knew where some of the touch points would be and some of the things that we needed to do to be able to move forward. One of the first things that we had done was to create a new value analysis and a vendor visitation policy. Both of those policies uh, incorporated all of the various aspects and the silos that we had within the health system and brought them under one umbrella so that we would be able to address them with a very small uh, document that was able to address most issues that would be covered by vendors within our facilities. And then within the policies, we also referenced other existing policies that were out there, such as uh, Gibson Entertainment, dress code, uh, code of conduct, uh, credential requirements, things like that, that would be needed for our vendors to be able to occupy our areas. And again, I spoke about the specific skill set for the role. Um, and as part of the introduction with my career, I did start out as a surgical tech and I was one of those that did have to learn uh, originally from many of the vendors and previously before many of the issues with AdvaMed and uh, the controls that were put into place with travel and support by vendors, uh, many of the vendors would send staff to educational opportunities around the country. And I was able to take advantage of a lot of those uh, previously through our various trauma and total joint uh, providers. And I learned early on what value the vendors would have, but I also learned what self-reliance was going to be as a benefit going forward. And what I was beginning to envision how the vendors would be able to help us help ourselves. Uh, I developed into the total joint coordinator for the orthopedic team, uh, ran the team for quite a few years, 
And again, I utilize the vendors both uh, within the perioperative setting to support our staff and also to try to connect them with our uh, purchasing and supply chain partners. Um, but again, we all had our own separate goals that we were trying to achieve by doing that. I moved into an implant analyst role within the uh, perioperative business office. Uh, again, it had very strong connections with the vendors, uh, moved up to the perioperative business manager and dealt with vendors on a daily basis. So I did have vendor engagement at every single role I've had within our health system. Um, and I learned the good, the bad and the ugly with our vendors there are, again, if they could be managed in a more proactive way, we would be successful in implementing many of the issues that we wanted to take care of within our facilities. Uh, if an institution is looking to incorporate this, there really does have to be a good communicator within this role because you've got to communicate both with your clinical providers, you have to communicate with your business office providers, you have to communicate with the vendors, um, and you also have to communicate with the public to a certain degree to let them understand what role the vendors are providing within their facility because much of the lay public does not exactly understand who these vendors are or what they're doing within the environments. Uh, previous vendor knowledge is an absolute plus. So again, this is a somewhat difficult role if someone has never been exposed to the vendors and how they operate within the facilities. Um, there does have to be a very firm but fair, uh, have picked up a reputation within our facilities to be known as Sheriff Woody. Uh, a lot of people have likened me to the Toy Story character because I tend to go around and uh, lay down the law, but I'm also very understanding. Many of our policies, uh, while they are in black and white, we use them as guidelines for uh, successful intelligent conversations and guidance for what should take place within our facilities to be able to meet with our requirements. You do have to have operational and institutional knowledge uh, to know how your facility works, what the needs are for the vendors, as well as what the needs are for your partners. And persistence is critical. Um, there is a very large vendor population out there. We use approximately 1,400 different vendors to support our uh, facilities. So it is a lot of balls spinning in the air at one time and it's you do have to be able to have line of sight on where your problems are where your success stories are and you've got to be able to drive home your points um, again with that many different people accessing the facilities there's always something going on and you, you really have to stay on top of it communication was key as we rolled out uh, our new program Internally, we had engagement and collaboration with the key stakeholders uh, from our senior leadership, our physician leadership, our nursing leadership, and our uh, end user team members. We had multiple, I believe it was about uh, 12 or 14 town hall events that we also provided in a webinar type basis, explaining the new policies, the process, introducing the people involved, both on the value analysis side and on the vendor management side. Uh, there were multiple mass emails that went out and we started this process about two and a half to three months prior to going live in March of 2019. Uh, for our external members, which would be the vendor population, we had mandatory attendance at informational forums. And again, these were in a town hall and a webinar format. We provided six different ones that were attended by more than 600 total vendor representatives. Um, we sent multiple emails out to all of the recorded vendors that had signed in and to our vendor management system for the previous 18 months. Uh, there was, as with any other industry, a fair amount of turnover within that population those 18 months. So we cast a very wide net um, and we were pretty successful at reaching most of the people uh, prior to go live. There was significant placement of signage throughout all the facilities, especially the areas where we had our largest vendor population, such as our procedural areas with the OR, the cath lab, uh, our ambulatory settings. Um, so that when we did go live, the 
incidents of vendors that were coming in saying, I've never heard of this, or when did you start this, was exceedingly low. We had probably on the order of less than 30 uh, within the first two to three weeks of going live. So once we went live, there was an uh, evolution of our vendor management platform. Again, with this program, we were set up to be flexible and nimble enough to address issues as they came along, institute new technologies, and to be able to look for ways to more adequately provide support to our staff. The Rep Scrubs program was our first uh, big change that we had. Uh, the Rep Scrubs program was identified as a solution to be able to provide better identification of our vendors, provide uh, cost avoidance with our cloth scrubs that we had, <clears throat> and to be able as another way of tracking our vendors within our facility. Uh, the Rep Scrubs were a completely different color than any of the scrubs that were used in our procedural areas. They have a red bouffant hat, which also identifies them from their vendor, from our uh, clinical staff. And they also have a name tag on the front of the uh, product that has the vendor name, the date, and the facility. So we were able to track and make sure that vendors were wearing a set of scrubs that were actually issued on that day, and this helped ensure that they had a clean, fresh set of scrubs. Prior to going live with the Rep Scrubs program, uh, we went around and took pictures <clears throat> of many of the vendors that we would see uh, both out in public, outside, without wearing lab coats, wearing our VCU health scrubs. Um, and again, you know, the bacterial load that they were generating coming in from the outside into our procedural areas was definitely suboptimal. Our legacy vendor management platform also was not meeting the needs of our health system. While it had been there for approximately six years prior to going live with this, as I said before, uh, it was not providing the level of data recall or trending data that we were needing to be able to show the success and the opportunities within our vendor management program. <clears throat> this was identified as a serious need because to be able to show any kind of trending data required an inordinate amount of manual manipulation of the sparse data that we had coming in. We went live with a simpler platform in December of 2019 for multiple reasons. First and foremost was that it had a much higher level of uh, data recall and utilization that we needed. And it was also much easier to use for our end users. We use a system whereby the vendors need to actually request an appointment with our clinical staff or our office staff prior to accessing the facilities. Uh, and the staff is able to approve, decline, or communicate with the vendors very easily just by clicking a link through their email. There is also a side benefit where the Simpler and the Rep Scrubs uh, platforms actually speak to each other. So we are able to generate a report showing compliance both with our address code and with our access uh, requirements within the institution by overlapping these two data points. So we were moving along and we thought we were doing pretty well with our system. We knew we had some opportunities, but we felt like we had a bit of a handle on where our vendor population was and where they should be. And then this spring, COVID-19 hit. Uh, this upended everything that all of us have known in healthcare. I can't use the term unprecedented enough to describe what we had to go to. Uh, the pressures that were put both on access to your facilities, utilization of PPE, uh, social distancing, needs to still operate under increasingly difficult budgetary constraints um, were again, in a word, unprecedented. 
for our COVID-19 response within our facilities, we were very similar to plenty of other facilities that were out there. I think there's some variation of this that have been done everywhere, but the genuine general tenants uh, tend to hold true for nearly everyone. The, our elective procedures were put on hold. Being a tertiary care center, we still had a fair amount of uh, procedures that were absolutely required to be done for our patient population, but we really cut back significantly. All visitation was stopped initially. Uh, this included both our patient visitors, our vendor visitors. Uh, it was pretty much complete lockdown. Uh, we closed all of our entry points down to our facilities. We went from, I believe it was 18 different ways to access our uh, downtown campus to uh, four main entry points where all staff was screened. Anyone trying to get into that uh, facility was screened and either denied access or were allowed to come in for their procedures if needed. Uh, everyone that came in was COVID screened by a set of questions and for a temperature check uh, to be able to ensure that we didn't have anyone symptomatic coming in. Our PPE resources had to be sequestered and allocated. We knew very early on that there would be difficulties and strains put on our supply chain uh, with respect to the different items that would be needed for PPE. Um, and again, this continues to go on. We have nearly weekly, it's a new issue that gets addressed somewhere along the line. Some product you were able to get yesterday and adequate supplies are completely gone. The word allocation has become part of the everyday uh, vernacular with all of our staff uh, and with our providers. It is a constant struggle to be able to get what you need when you need it in order to continue your daily functions. For the business impacts of COVID-19, uh, financially there was a material increase in net income. This is kind of across the board. When you reduce the economic engine, that is your procedural areas, you are gonna achieve uh, a significantly lower bottom line. Uh, there's an increased usage of PPE that was required due to the response at significantly higher price points than pre-COVID. The loss of elective surgeries was absolutely concerning. No one knew exactly how much you were going to lose, how long this was going to go on, uh, and what the solution was going to be to the return to quote unquote normal. Uh, PPE shortages for the staff during the pandemic were completely unexpected to the level that they were. Uh, you know, again, things that you were able to get the day before, you were no longer able to get. And creative solutions had to be developed uh, to be able to get the bare minimums for your staff to operate safely. There was an international search for compliant PPE. Uh, there was ability, uh, once the response had gone on for a bit, to be able to get PPE, but to find stuff that was actually compliant uh, with the requirements and safe for our staff to use was still a challenge. The burn rate calculations were a daily function uh, to figure out exactly how much you're using, where you're using it, what's the best way to allocate it within your units um, to be able to provide a stockpile that you needed. The inventory stockpile development, we started originally with three to four days on hand and we knew that was not gonna be adequate. So we, through very hard work, we were able to uh, add more and more PPE by controlling the amount we were burning and by other mitigation techniques, we were able to actually have enough for our staff to function safely. With your policy updates there, had to be new entry requirements because we knew that the, anyone coming into your facilities in the future would have to be as much as you could possibly uh, control <clears throat> either COVID negative or asymptomatic to come in. Still would be a limitation on the entry points to be able to do the screening that was needed. Uh, vendor access was going to start again, but it had to be limited. And we did have to have a way to track your visitors uh, to with the access for your patients and staff for in-person clinic visits. Our OR volume initially decreased 62% in the first three months uh, as a COVID response. Uh, since then, we have bounced back significantly once we our state reopened. Uh, 
Uh, right now, we're functioning somewhere around 103 to 105% of our volume. Um, our staff is working very hard to make up for the backlog of procedures that we had out there, and they're doing an exceedingly good job. Our vendor traffic decreased by 78%. We only allowed vendors in originally for absolutely critical cases where uh, they had to be on site. There was no other alternative. And to their point, many of the vendors also, they were operating in an unknown uh, arena as well. Many of their companies had restricted them from being able to travel or to go into their facilities until there was better identification of where things were going. Um, since then, that has changed. Um, and we're still trying to work towards a solution that's amenable to all. So with our reopening strategies, we knew there had to be a thoughtful measured reopening. We didn't do anything as a knee jerk reaction. We really looked at what the opportunities were for reopening, what was gonna be the ripple effect. And we engaged with many of our stakeholders along the way to figure out the best way forward. Our elective procedures were restarted uh, at the end of May uh, after the edict from the governor allowed us to proceed. Uh, so we knew we had to get the patients in there. The question is, what about the other people that needed to come in, either visitors or vendors for them? So we decided to let vendors come in uh, with some very strict uh, limitations. There had to be uh, additional COVID screening that took place uh, symptom screening both by a questionnaire and by temperature checks that took place at our entry points. And we still restricted vendors uh, very much to only critical patient procedural support, to uh, critical infrastructure repair. And if there were any uh, implementations that had been approved pre-COVID that were critical to daily operations, we allowed vendors in if only if they could not support it either remotely or with a bare minimum number of vendors and able to support it. Uh, we did have continued allocation of PPE, and this still goes on to today uh, to be able to monitor and mitigate the amount of usage that we have. We didn't have a change to our general visitation policy. Uh, we still were allowing no visitors except in extreme cases. And then we loosened that up uh, about a month after we started the elective procedures to one visitor uh, per patient, um, except in our pediatric areas, we did allow two visitors so that both parents could be there or end of life for COVID patients on a case-by-case -case basis and in coordination with the care team. Uh, we did implement the Raptor screening system for identification with our vendors. And the Raptor visitor screening system uh, was initially research proposed and put forth into our environment by our BCU Health Violence Prevention Committee. This was a multidisciplinary committee uh, that was looking at doing this as a way of mitigating some of the opportunities for either visitor on visitor, visitor on staff, or patient on staff violence that uh, we had taking place. Again, we're a level one trauma center in a urban setting, um, and we tend to have uh, probably a higher instance of violence uh, than some of the other facilities in our outlying areas. The Raptor system was originally designed to function as a school visitor management platform. Uh, primary purpose is to better track visitors coming into the environment during overnight hours and to provide visual designation uh, to visitors that include their picture, destination, date and time of their visit arrival. Uh, we expanded the utilization of this system during the pandemic response to all hours to help assist with contract contact tracing and to uh, cover that niche of the one population we did not have an eye on within our facilities. We knew where our staff was and who our staff was. Uh, we knew who our vendor population was, but we didn't know all these other people that were coming in that were uh, just visitors. So this provided a solution so that we really have an all encompassing view of everyone that is within our facilities at all times. 
there is a cost benefit to proactive vendor management. Uh, for us, the cost avoidance with the Rep Scrubs pr program was about 25,000 annually so far uh, with our vendor population. This, we do not have to provide any scrubs. We don't have scrubs going missing. We don't have to uh, wash any scrubs. The Rep Scrubs program is supported by the vendors themselves. Uh, Rep Scrubs allows the technology and the equipment to be within uh, the facilities and they provide outstanding support uh, with that. Um, and I can't say enough good things about that uh, program to be able to help as a, a extremely critical portion of our success. The cost avoidance of the PPE by restricting our vendor access, and this was both pre-COVID and during COVID, is about 12,000 a year. Um, that is a probably an underestimated number um, that's needed, and it's going to vary within the different facilities depending on what PPE requirements are. Um, but again, this is you know, you really want to have vendors within your facility that you need, not the ones that are there just for their convenience. And there is a cost associated with that um, and anything that you can do, especially in these tight economic times for healthcare facilities is, is definitely to your benefit. Um, one of the biggest areas we had within the vendor management system is the identification and stop paying of non-approved items. Uh, these are items that may not typically live within your item master. They're what we call bill-only items that vendors bring in for specific cases. And uh, prior to this system and even within the system, um, well, I'll say prior to the system, vendors were able just to bring in pretty much anything they wanted to, and it got paid uh, just by having a clinical person sign off on the bill only. It got pushed through, and there weren't any real checks and balances to make sure that what was being paid for was actually approved or was at the best price that we should have been getting for it. Um, once this system was put in, we were averaging about $80,000 a week uh, and non-approved items that were coming in that we stopped payment on. This really does need to be an all hands on deck approach. Um, your success of the program is definitely determined by the level of your staff engagement. Um, all the levels from the senior leadership down to the frontline people, the end users that are out there have to be actively engaged, have to understand what this system is used for the reasons for the program need to be reinforced uh, positively and often. You have to use anecdotal evidence of things that are working, uh, areas that you can work and the collaboration that's needed to make it work. And then you can utilize the data if you have a strong vendor management platform to be able to show the positive effects and the way that you are trending. Um, and again, to identify opportunities within your system but it absolutely cannot be uh, someone uh, operating in isolation to be able to be successful with vendor management. There are ongoing challenges. Um, again, this is a journey of chaos coordination. We are nowhere near the end of it just due to the size of our facilities and healthcare as an entity now. Um, there's always gonna be things that we can improve. Um, and especially in, with COVID as the added uh, entity that we need to figure out how to navigate, you need to figure out how to support our staff better without the vendors physically present. Um, one of the other issues we found is COVID testing as a screening mechanism. Uh, there's been a lot of question about having negative COVID testing prior to vendors accessing because again, that is just a point in time of showing uh, that someone may have been uh, negatively tested originally. Um, we did have one situation where we had someone that had a previous negative COVID test that was required by another health system within our city um, that came in and they were actually positive when they were within our facility. And this caused uh, 14 of our residents and attendings to be quarantined as well as uh, six members from that uh, vendor company that had to be quarantined as well. And this was for an educational opportunity that had taken place for our uh, resident physician staff. So we, we question how 
how that is. That's an area to be developed in the future. Hopefully they'll come out with a better, more accurate test that can be done uh, on site with a rapid return to be able to have some kind of integrity to, to show that they are safe to be in your facility. Um, we need to figure out how to ensure that new technology and products are available. We do want to remain at the forefront of uh, healthcare, and it is important to have your vendors available to do that. Large group education is also a challenge uh, due to the size and restrictions with social distancing. Um, availability of PPE it looks like it's going to be a challenge for quite a while still, and we need to figure out how to uh, mitigate that utilization. And the safety of all of our visitors due to the community spread that's out there is really a paramount right now. We need to look for solutions for it. Some of the creative opportunities we have to look forward to this are video integration technology within the procedural areas. Uh, I have been working with a couple of larger entities that are out there um, that are actively looking at uh, vendor support, being able to do a remote link to be able to see into the rooms, uh, provide support as needed without having a vendor physically on site. Um, remote support can take various forms. Uh, the question is gonna be what uh, privacy concerns there are, what uh, support a vendor is gonna be able to provide in that aspect, how they can visualize what the field is and what their needs are, and that's gonna be uh, very case by case dependent. We really wanna look at uh, re-engaging our vendors with staff training, and we wanna have some of our staff elevated to a super user, if you will, to be able to train our other staff with them. And if that is something along the lines of having some of our staff, again, go to industry and be trained by them with some of the same training that they provide to their vendor reps, um, we're working actively with quite a few of ours that uh, seem very willing to be able to provide that level of support. Um, PPE use mitigation strategies, we're using a pretty innovative system where we're doing some uh, UV uh, sterilization of uh, N95 masks, face shields, things of those nature to be able to extend the life of some of the items that we have out there. And we're also working with industry, uh, again, to look for the support for the training uh, opportunities within our facilities, both for our staff and for our clinicians. So in conclusion, in order to be successful with a vendor management program, it has to be an absolutely focused, determined effort. It can't be uh, all over the place scattershot. It can't be separated into multiple areas. Uh, it really needs to be, uh, you know, somebody that can drive this home to be able to be successful. Um, collaborative engagement is the cornerstone to the successful program, no matter if it's a 50-bed hospital, a 1,000-bed system, uh, whatever it is, you have to have everyone involved uh, to be able to have this system function as you would want it to be. Um, it, the sky is really the limit. It's an uncharted territory, and there will be pitfalls, but ultimately it is for the benefit of the health system, um, and we are proof it can be done. So thank you all very much for your time. Uh, appreciate you joining this afternoon and glad to take any questions. Thank you, Will, so much. We did have a few questions come in throughout the presentation and it looks like we have enough time to get to those. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the first one, you recognize that pre-COVID-19 there was a lack of data. Have you since piloted studies on the impact on your facilities? And if so, what were the results? So we have been fortunate um, within our facilities. We're, we're kind of set up for some good pilot programs that we have done um, previously. And I had used many of the same pathways that I had learned through my climb through the perioperative leadership. Uh, we have our main OR and then we have our ambulatory ORs, which are um, a much smaller version, much more controlled facility to where we're able to see um, what can take place, what we need to use before we roll it out. Uh, we did look at, again, some of the data that we had from our old legacy system um, and used it to where we could. And that was one of the things that really made us go out and identify a new system to provide better data tracking for our vendor population. And 
again, once we looked at that, we were able to make very small changes at a time um, within our ambulatory setting and see how, what effect it would have. And pretty much invariably, that's where uh, we were able to find successes and other opportunities that came forward. Um, <clears throat> and we were able to be successful, you know, again, because we were able to pilot it without rolling something out on a grand scale um, until we were sure it was going to work. Excellent. The next question that came in, what did you find was the most effective way to communicate your new vendor management process? Um, again, you don't really believe you can have too much communication both with your internal and external stakeholders um internally it, it's probably critical that you do have data and you can show the benefit to your providers and to your end users um, if they don't think that it's going to work for them they're less apt to be engaged actively to be able to make it work and uh, there had to be a little bit of a leap of faith. Again, we we came from such a mismanaged and chaotic uh, environment that everyone had kind of gotten used to it, and we had put band-aids on the process previously, and we're we're very hesitant to pull the band-aids off to see where it would happen because while it were, wasn't working well, we were able to limp along. Um, so that was probably our most critical part is getting our internal stakeholders engaged and be able to have that communication with them. You have to meet the staff where they are able to attend. So that's when we did have the town halls and the webinars, they were on multiple days of the week, including the weekends. They were during working hours or off shift hours. Um, and we also recorded webinars for staff to be able to uh, connect when they weren't able to do it. Um, with the vendor population, I think it was imperative that we made it a mandatory requirement that they came in, signed in, and showed that they were actually uh, given the notification where things were going to change. Um, I think if we did not have that, we would have had significant challenge with vendors showing up, and then you run around all day putting out fires. You, you have to be able to um, be very proactive with them. And again, be very firm with them um, and let them know that we're not doing this in a putative way. This is going to be uh, basically it's going to help us, but it's also going to help you. Vendors really didn't have to come in and spend all day uh, wandering around hoping they could run into somebody. For them, it was kind of, a, I use the analogy, it was they were fishing, but they were using the wrong bait. And it's very different if you have to go fish in the open ocean um, with one hook and you're not sure when you're going to catch something, as opposed to if you go to a fish farm when you know exactly when the physician is going to be there, they want to actually talk to you or hear what you have to say, and they're more engaged. It's, it's time well spent both for the vendor and for the end user. Okay, looks like we have time for one more question. When you reopened elective procedures amidst COVID-19, what was the response from your staff? What was the response from vendors? Uh, I'm gonna say with the staff, there was a lot of trepidation. We weren't really sure what it was gonna look like, how it was gonna work out. Um, again, we were probably pretty proactive. Uh, with our reopening strategy, we had a fair idea when the governor was going to allow us to begin those things. So we started actually seeing patients on a virtual and an in-person uh, status prior to that. Somewhere around the beginning of May, we started making clinic visits with these patients, getting them ready for the procedure. So we were able to get them to start coming in. Staff really did not know what they were going to do, but they they knew how well they had survived during the heart of COVID, and we were able to survive without our large vendor population at that point. Uh, they, while it was slightly uncomfortable for them, they knew they could do it. So they also knew at our heart we were going to be able to open it up when the time was right and and we have since very slowly methodically reopened uh to a certain degree our vendor access at this point now we're at about probably 75 percent of our pre-covid uh vendor uh 
visits that we're having and that's probably what we're looking at keeping at this point um we we've determined one of the helpful things i guess you could say through the whole COVID experience is we determined really what do you have to have not what's nice to have but what do you need to have and um that's kind of what we've been operating under is what, what do we really need to do for the good of the patient for the staff um and that's since we've reopened there you know there have been some friction points with our staff because they while uh, I alluded to the overdependence that we had, um, by by and large, they've been able to feel comfortable with we will get them what they need when they need it to be able to provide appropriate and safe patient care. Um, for the vendors, it has been somewhat different. Um, while there have been some that have been 100% uh, compliant and understanding of what the needs are and what the requirements of the facilities are and what the safest thing is both for our team members our visitors and for them is to stay away until we you know until it's absolutely safe for them to come in some of them knew they had to come in just as a function some of the others that we had that it wasn't critical for them to be there prior to um are really driven by that need for loss of income that they had during the COVID times. And they've been very aggressive with coming in. We've had a pretty high instance, uh, particularly within the last month of uh, vendors from different segments of uh, vendor population coming in, uh, trying to come in under the radar. So it's had added an extra level of vigilance um, to be able to ensure that we still are able to maintain our compliance. And I've got to give kudos to our staff. They've been extremely engaged and helpful. Uh, and we've been successful in identifying these needs and, and steering the vendor population back to um, doing the appropriate things that were needed both pre-COVID and going to be needed post-COVID. Well, thank you for that. We have run up on time here. If we didn't get to your question, no worries. Uh, Will, as well as the team at Rep Scrubs, will receive a copy of your questions and follow up at the conclusion of the webinar. Will, we'd like to thank you for a great presentation. I would like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the products they provide to our industry. You can do so at repscrubs.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your CE credit, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is sub submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We will be back in two weeks with another webinar. Visit ortoday.com forward slash webinars for details and complimentary registration. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.